I'll, I'll call the meeting to order and welcome everybody. Um, now we'll start with um, approval of the minutes. Everybody had a chance to read them. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Approved mm -hmm. by uh, Pat Mahoney, my Colbert County member, and a second by Sandy Hertz. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. So we'll move right along. And Kate says we're not going to go by the agenda. We're going to do projects first. Yes. And we'll start with Susan. Okay, thank you, Sharon Deegan. And um, my apologies in advance. In advance, we're going to move through this pretty quickly um, this morning. So I'm going to um, skip through a few of these slides. Just to let you know up front. So um, I'm Susan McClough and I'll be presenting the Historic St. Mary City Commission Department of General Services State House Accessible Restroom Project. And before we continue, I would like to introduce Joe Kangas. He's sitting in the back, Director of Facilities and Grounds for Historic St. Mary City, and he'll be available to answer any questions you may have. Okay, Historic St. Mary City proposes to construct a new State House Accessible Restroom Facility on the site of the existing non-accessible restroom facility. The proposed work involves demolishing the existing restroom structure, constructing a new structure, along with an accessible concrete walkway, and removal of existing brick and timber stairs within steep slopes. The new restroom facility has been designed and cited to meet ADA requirements and will provide safe, accessible facilities to all historic St. Mary City visitors. So the project does require conditional approval under COMAR by the commission due to buffer disturbances and impacts to steep slopes. So you can see where the project is located here. Uh, St. Mary's County, uh, a little zoomed in on historic St. Mary's City. Here's the project location. And then um, you can see the project here. This is the existing facility and the reconstructed state house. So again, you can see the, uh, the proposed uh, project project is located here. This is the existing um, facility. It's difficult to see, but this is the existing access path right here. Um, and these are, this is where the uh, existing brick and timber steps within a steep slope will be removed and this area will be revegetated. Re and then a new access pathway will be located right like this. Um, and as you can see, the IDA is red uh, in red shading in this slide and the RCA is the green shading. So the project is entirely located within the RCA. So here's the site plan showing the proposed conditions. The existing restroom facility is shown in red, and the new facility and ADA compliant walkway is shown in yellow. The green indicates the area of can canopy removal within the buffer. And as you can see, the footprint of the new facility is larger than the existing facility. And expan this expansion is required to provide additional space within the the building to accommodate wheelchair access and other accessibility features. So there are no impacts to tidal or non-tidal wetlands or any other H habitat prote protection areas except for the critical area buffer. Um, proposed lot coverage is 0 0.03 acres, existing lot coverage is 0 0.1. Overall lot coverage on the Statehouse, par Statehouse parcel still meets the 15% lot coverage limit. Uh, you can see the buffer impacts uh, outlined here. It's 1,189 1, square feet of permanent disturbance, 1,400 square feet of canopy removal, and then that 550 square feet of existing brick and timber stairs that we removed within the steep slope. And because this is a state project, the 10% phosphorus reduction is required. And for this project, it's 0 0.03 pounds of phosphorus. And due to the potential to impact archaeological resources, there's no on-site stormwater management proposed. So the 10% uh, pollutant reduction requirement will be met with additional plantings and the installation of one 50-gallon rain barrel. So uh, the, the, on, the proposed mitigation is being provided both on-site and off-site, and both those uh, planting plans are attached to your staff report. Uh, the slide on, this slide is showing the on-site planting area. And it also shows the proposed species, um, including white oak, scarlet oak, and wild azalea. And I just wanted to point out here, this is um, the existing brick and timber stairs. And this is the area where that um, lot coverage will be removed, and this area will be revegetated. Re and this will be the new access 
from the state house. So for agency reviews, um, stormwater management is not required because the LOD is less than 5,000 square feet. Erosion and sediment control was approved by MDE. Um, DNR Wildlife and Heritage Service confirmed there's no records for state or federal uh, rare, threatened, or endangered species. For MHT, um, in a letter uh, dated June 17th, they determined that the project would constitute an adverse effect on historic, pro on the historic property. So Historic St. Mary City agreed to fulfill two conditions related to recordation and archaeological monitoring to satisfactorily reduce the adverse effect. And in a uh, later email dated August 2nd, MHT stated that consultation with Historic St. Mary City will be ongoing as the project moves into, the const into construction. And MHT has no objection to critical area review and approval of the project. So Historic St. Mary City did complete a coastal resiliency analysis as required by COMAR. Uh, the entirety of the project, uh, shown by the, the red dots here, is located outside of vulnerable locations, um, beyond the 10-foot the sea level rise zone, beyond Hurricane 1 through 4 storm surges, and there are no mapped wetland adaptation areas on the site. Public notice, of course, is required, and the project was published in the Southern Maryland News, and a sign was posted on site with no comments received. The project will result in buffer disturbance impacts to steep slopes, and therefore conditional approval is required. So in accordance with COMAR, Historic St. Mary City has submitted information to meet the, the conditional approval requirements. So the conditional approval process begins on page five of the staff report, and detailed information is available there on how the project does conform to the requirements in COMAR. To summarize, the buffer disturbance and impacts to steep slopes cannot be avoided due to the existing topography, and the proposed mitigation for those impacts will stabilize the steep slopes and reduce runoff, thereby providing public benefits to the critical area program. If the proposed impacts are not allowed, it would prevent Historic St. Mary City from meeting ADA requirements and providing accessible restroom facilities to all visitors. The project otherwise conforms to COMAR, and the proposed mitigation will provide water quality and habitat benefits in keeping with the intent of the critical area law. So I will now turn it back over to Chairman Deegan. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any questions? I just have one question about the rain barrel. Is there um, a way to ask them for a use of the water? Like, are they going to have like a soaker hose or is it going to be reused into the landscaping irrigation? How will it be emptied between storm events? Okay, that is a very good question and I will let Joe answer that. Um, if he has any knowledge about where the water that's being collected in the 50 gallon rain barrel, how that might be used on site? Um, down the hill there, we could have several options. It could go to a soaker hose. It has not been designed yet, but we could do that very easily and uh, water some plants that are down lower or some of the plantings that are going in now. It is a, a large hill, so obviously water has to run downhill, so we are limited to how far that can, can go at that point, but we can design something to protect the water. So it's not a bad idea. Yeah, I think that it's more like, again, rain well, will, rain guard next to it just takes over. So it dewaters between the event, because once it's filled up, if you don't use the water, mm -hmm. it's a great thought, but you gotta have like something that you water in the garden or having, a, having something, like maybe a, I don't know what's there, but like, people, the herb gardens and things, but as long as they have a way to be watered, that's not a good idea to me. Thank you. Chairman Dude, uh, seeing you have your, have your cane there, I'm very familiar with this site as I'm St. Mary's County Commissioner. Uh, you would not be able to get down to where that restroom <laughs> is, sir, uh, the way it is now. This is a sorely needed. Uh, improvement. That's good because I'm getting ready to use this one here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but my, my, my point here is uh, St. Mary Wellick, did you ask if there any questions, sir? <laughs> now, if you want me to wait till you get back, I No, no, because Sandy can take my place. Go ahead. <laughs> well, my point on this thing is this. that St. Mary City is going through quite a evolution of uh, improvements. They just had a big pavilion put down there and and millions of dollars are coming. Delegate Crosby, I was told, brought $39 million into new uh, amenities to go in down in St. Mary's City. So my point is this. It's an RCA designation.
situation? It seems like it should be an IDA. I, I, I'm very familiar with this from my role as commissioner. I was also on the board of uh, governors for Cowart Marine Museum and Brother Mahoney, and, I'm sorry, Mayor Mahoney's. <laughs> and, the, and the point was is that they were IDA over there. <laughs> this needs to be IDA. What's the process to change it? Now, it's state owned. Mm -hmm. The White House. The White House. Um, <laughs> Commissioner Hewitt, so state facilities um, do not need to go through a gross allocation process. The, yeah, I heard that earlier. Right, and so in this one, the, the conditional approval process was not required for the RCA use. It was only required because of the impacts to the buffer and the steep slopes. So from time to time, there are projects proposed by local government in the RCA on their properties or by the state in the RCA and that use might need a conditional approval, that is not the case here. So the RCA use is in recognition of the entirety of the historic St. Mary City facility, um, and that's why that designation is there and in place. That's why it's RCA instead of IDA? Correct. It's the entirety of the whole parcel I continue to run into little glitches, whether it's something to do with MDE with a little, you know, structure they put on the pier or you know, other things that they do that it seems like IDA would make a difference in their in their ability to, to make improvements. Who wants to know how to change it? I know. Yeah, we, yeah, we can't change the designation. The designation is what it is. It's been in place since the original program was approved. So it's, it's non-negotiable. Yes. Yeah. Is the facility on sewer or is it uh, a uh, septic? septic? That's another good question, and Joe, I will ask your assistance for that. Is it up to sewer? Or holding tanks. Holding tanks. Yes. Yeah. And the holding tank is located under the or near the existing restroom facility? Uh, adjacent within about 15 feet. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions? Chair recognize Sandy Hertz. Thank you. On behalf of the project subcommittee, I move that the commission approve the historic St. Mary City Commission and the Department of General Services proposal to demolish an existing one-story restroom facility and construct a new ADA accessible restroom facility near the State House of 1676. The existing restroom facility, which is located within the expanded critical area buffer, and is accessed by brick and mortar stairs down a steep hill is not ADA compliant. The new two-story restroom facility has been designed and cited to meet ADA requirements and will include an accessible concrete sidewalk and footbridge to provide access to the restroom, the restrooms from the state house. This project requires conditional approval by the commission under Comar 27.02.06 because the proposed disturbance in the buffer is not water dependent and because the project will impact steep slopes. Mm -hmm. This motion to approve is based on the following considerations. Number one, the proposed facility will be located in the same area as the existing facility, except for impacts to the critical area buffer, which has been expanded for steep slopes. There are no other impacts to habitat protection areas. The project has been located to minimize potential impacts to archaeological resources. Con consultation between HSMC and the Maryland Historic Trust will be ongoing as the project moves, moves to construction to reduce the potential adverse effect on the historic property. As a result, the proposed project is in compliance with the relevant chapters of this subtitle. Number two, the project limit of disturbance is less than 5,000 square feet. Therefore, stormwater management is not required by MDE. HSMC proposes to meet the critical area 10% phosphorus reduction requirement through on-site and off-site planting and the installation of one 50-gallon rain barrel. Mitigation for buffer impacts will include approximately 4,000 square feet of mitigation planting on-site and 31,000 square feet of pro uh, provided off-site. Number three. The proposed project offers public benefits to the critical area program by selecting a mitigation design that incorporates the removal of existing impervious cover and the restoration and revegetation of a steep slope. The proposed native shrub species that will be used to stabilize the slope will provide both habitat and water quality benefits. 
Is that it? I think. Can I for one point of correction? Sure. I think you meant to say 3,100 square feet of planting provided off-site and not 31,000. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> do, we, do we have a second? Commissioner Hewitt? Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Yeah, opposed? None. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Next, we'll move from, to <coughs> Jen Esposito, who's going to talk about Charles County Development of Parks and Recreations, Chapel Point State Park Improvements. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Deegan. Um, I apologize in advance for the very abridged version I'm about to go through. Um, today, we are bringing the Chapel Point State Park Improvements before you on behalf of Charles County. We do have Kyle Redding here from um, Charles County uh, Planning and Growth Management. Um, and this is brought to you before you today at uh, Comar 2702-0601 as a conditional approval. So Chapel Point Park is located in Charles County um, on the east side of the Port Tobacco River, which is a tributary to the Potomac. Outline of the park is shaded in green. The park comprises of 821 acres, of which 214 are located in the critical area on resource conservation area lands. It comprises a mix of forest and agricultural lands and has several streams, wetlands, and beaches. The park is actually owned by Department of Natural Resources um, Maryland Park Service, but 50 acres are leased um, to the county under a lease agreement, and that is the yellow shaded areas on here. The proposed project, again, is um, directed by the lease agreement between Maryland Park Service and Department of Natural Research and the county. Um, and it, they have an approved management plan. And under that plan, um, it kind of directs the county to improve access roads and provide additional parking areas um, for an increase in visitation that they are currently seeing. So there's three areas um, that we'll talk about today. I'm going to go through photos. Um, there are more detailed site plans are attached to your staff report as attachment one. But I'll be talking about the North Fisherman access up here, and then access roads. This is the main entry of the park. Um, also, the county is proposing a 1,400 square foot um, pole barn maintenance building with parking, and then down to Midway Beach access and the actual beach access. Um, this is for hand carry watercraft only, um, and the parking currently is up this area, so there's a long way for people to travel um, if they have canoes and kayaks and such. So um, again, site plan uh, and a detailed scope of work is provided on page two of your staff report as well, but a lot of the improvements are um, improving and paving existing um, access roadways and slightly expanding some areas um, for to allow for better two-way traffic. And then for the North Fisherman access, um, there's a parking area where people kind of just on busy days find any areas to park, which are parking outside of more defined areas. So that's why they're proposing to add a, additional parking areas in this area, pave this area as well. They will be providing um, a grass swale to the north side of the parking area and a micro basin to the south side of the parking area to help um, treat existing and new impervious surface. They will also be placing reinforced turf down to the shoreline access and providing a gate up here for permitted access only, mainly for fishermen, watermen, um, to be able to bring their boat down and, and go fishing and get their catch and come back. Um, and that's basic gist of the North Fisherman access improvements. Here, the um, access road and where the maintenance um, pole barn building will be installed on a fallow field, you see here. And this is for your Midway Beach access drive and your actual shoreline access down to the Midway Beach. Um, the existing tree line is shown in the dark area here. They will be expanding parking and adding new parking areas into the existing tree line. The forest area on site has been determined as um, forest and interior dwelling species habitat. Um, however, a site visit um, with commission staff and our science advisor, Claudia Jones, um, the 
predominant species along these areas where the parking is proposed is Alianthus tree of heaven, um, which is an invasive species because these sites were previously um, impacted for structures and other improvements um, historically. They're also um, adding some porta potties along the way. Um, and again, this is for hand carry um, watercraft only. And this is just a site to show you how narrow the area is and some areas where parking will um, encroach into the existing tree line. This is, um, there's a historic corn crib on site that we'll be placing structural um, fencing around that um, structure. And this is your access down to Midway Beach. They will be um, improving the grade here and putting reinforced turf down here as well. So the reason why this project is before you today, again, because it's a conditional approval, there are um, some non-water dependent um, impacts to the buffer. There's also water dependent impacts to the buffer and canopy removed. This um, table is provided to you on page three of your staff report. Each various um, impacts in the buffer will get a very uh, uh, impact ratio. Um, and then there's also um, buffer clearing um, outside, or sorry, forest clearing outside the buffer. So the total impact required mitigation is 2.27 acres. And they are providing a dish, um, over an acre of mitigation on top of what is required for a total of 3.29 acres in the form of landscape stock and seedling stock. We're getting at least, we're getting more than one-to-one, -one, but we're getting at least one-to-one -one mitigation inside the buffer um, in the form of um, native canopy understory and herbaceous um, total around the site to also help uh, enhance existing fits habitat as well. The county has received local stormwater and erosion and sediment control plans. They are meeting the guidelines as um, outlined for FIDS, for DNR Wildlife and Heritage Service. There is a waterfall concentration area on site, but there's no in-water work um, uh, impacts uh, proposed at this time. There are two recorded archaeological sites um, in the project vicinity, but the project itself will not have an adverse, will not have a adverse effect. There are no critical habitats, refuge lands, or fish hatcheries, um, as indicated by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the county met their public notice requirements. Um, again, they had to respond to the conditional approval, um, indicating how this project is meeting certain standards. Uh, they're a list in great detail on page four through six of your staff report, but to um, Summarize, again, this is dictated by a lease agreement between Maryland Park Service and the county um, through their management plan to better define existing parking areas and provide enhanced additional public access. They're providing best management practice to treat existing and new impervious surface and they're mitigating their buffer impacts that are considered non-water dependent at a three to one ratio back on site. And with that, I will turn it back over to Chair Deegan. Okay, thank you very much, Jen. Any questions, Jen? Seeing none, I'll recognize Sandy Hertz, Chairman of the uh, Project Subcommittee. Thank you, Chairman Deegan. On behalf of the Project Subcommittee and in accordance with the staff report and presentation, I move that the Commission approve the Charles County Recreation, Parks, and Tourism proposal to expand and improve shoreline access at the North Fishing Access and Midway, Midway Beach Access areas of Chapel Point Park to account for the increase in recreational use the park is experiencing. The park is owned by the Department of Natural Resources. However, the 50 acres on which the Phase Two project is located are managed and maintained by Charles County. Proposed improvements include installation of a new gravel access drive and maintenance building, improvements to existing access roads for both the North Fisherman and Midway Beach areas of the park, replacement and installation of kiosks and interpretive panels, expanded parking options, and relocation and installation of portable restrooms. This project requires conditional approval by the Commission under Comar 27.02.06 because portions of the proposed improvements in the buffer are not water dependent and because the project will expand portions of existing roads and parking areas already located in the critical area buffer. This motion to approve is based on the following considerations. 
With the exception of the expanded road and parking areas noted previously, the proposed project is in compliance with the relevant chapters of this subtitle. Number two, the county is providing three to one mitigation for all non-water dependent critical area buffer impacts. The total mitigation provided exceeds the required mitigation for the project by an acre. Number three, the proposed project offers public benefits to the critical area program by providing treatment for runoff for stormwater runoff for, from 3.87 acres. This includes eliminating the highly eroded runoff going down the access drives at both shorelines. In addition, the inclusion of access controls will reduce vehicular traffic at the water's edge, further providing water quality and habitat benefits. No more to that motion? That's it. Good. Second by Sue Greer. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, I see we're ready to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Any abstentions? None. Motion carries. Thank you very much. And Lisa, are you ready for uh, regulations now? I am. We're going to say goodbye to Sandy. I apologize for them having to go through their projects quicker than normal, So, um, but I appreciate that they were able to do that. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to present to you a proposal for regulations, as you've seen me done many times. Um, the program subcommittee had the benefit of seeing this draft last month as information, and they just did a quick review this morning with me. Um, it includes a, re a revision, excuse me, of chapter four of the Shorey Road Control chapter. And as you may recall, we've been going through methodically every chapter of COMAR Title 27 in order to update it since these regulations were first promulgated and actually voted on by the General Assembly back in the late 80s. So what we're trying to do is to go through each chapter and update them accordingly with regard to updates to state law that have happened in the last 30 some years and regulations, um, including those of other agencies, not just ours. So as I said, we're modernizing the drafting style, updating and deleting outdated provisions. The first thing we're doing is we are changing some definitions. We're updating um, the agricultural best management definition because it includes um, provisions about shore erosion. And we're inserting for the first time a new term, shoreline stabilization measure. And the reason for that is when MDE's uh, statute was updated and subsequently their regulations, this is the terminology they're using. So we are trying to make our regulations use the same type of terminology. You're gonna see this pop up in other sections. Also in subtitle 01 chapter four, which is the actual shoreline Erosion Protection Works chapter, you can see at the top of the slide, I have it in brackets because we are repealing that and we're going to now call it by the new name, the new shiny name, Shoreline Stabilization Measures. So in the definition section of this chapter, again, we are repealing the old um, label or terminology, if you will. Uh, we're putting in an applicability section to make clear what we're talking about with regard to shore erosion or shoreline stabilization measures versus water dependent, because sometimes we've seen over the years applicants get confused. So we make sure we're using the right chapter for the right uh, structure. And then we're redrafting the policies and criteria regulations, again, updating and deleting outdated provisions. In chapter nine, our habitat protection areas chapter, um, the regulation 01 is the buffer regulations. Again, you'll see we're repealing and um, proposing the uh, proper language or terms, so taking out shore ridge control, inserting shoreline stabilization measure. Same thing in Regulation 01-2, mitigation and planting standards. And then similarly, in Regulation 01-3, buffer management plans, we're repealing that term again, but we're also making clear that local approval of a shoreline stabilization measure as authorized by both the Board of Public Works and the Maryland Department of the Environment because sometimes um, structures are of such a size that they actually need uh, approval through the Board of Public Works and then other structures just need authorization through the Maryland Department of the Environment. 
In chapter 14, which is a fairly new chapter, you all voted on this within the last year. It's subsequently become effective. It is our renewable energy generating systems regulation. We like long titles. Um, in the regulation specifically 06, the planting plan requirements, again, we're repealing the old language and putting in the new language. Moving on to subtitle 02, regulation 01, this is almost a, a duplication of our definition section in subtitle 01. Um, so we're, again, we're, we're messing with the terminology. Moving on to chapter five, um, specifically in regulation five, again, the terminology, we're inserting an applicability section like we did in subtitle 01, and we're repealing and reenacting certain policies and criteria to do the updates. And then in Regulation 15-3, planting plan requirements, again, we're, we're repealing and enacting the new language. So going back to Subtitle 01, specifically Chapter 2, in the um, regulations under 06, this is where we have all of our regulations regarding growth allocation, how to use it, where it comes from, what we want to see. Um, but what we're doing here is we're trying to clarify for municipalities and small towns that their growth allocation pot is allowed to use more than half of its pot um, allocated to them for properties that may be RCA and bumping up to either an LDA or an IDA designation. Um, so we wanted to make that clear in the regulations because it wasn't as clear in the law, but that was the intent. So we're making that change in Regulation 06-3. And again, 06-1, um, we're making a clarification about the 100-foot buffer. It used to just say buffer. So we want it to be clear because there's lots of buffers in the state besides ours. We want it to be clear we're talking about our 100-foot buffer. The staff recommendation is for the, um, the commission actually to concur with the chairman's um, recommendation that this be reviewed as a refinement so that the staff can proceed with having these regulations. Not I'm a refinement. Sorry. What did I do wrong? It's not a refinement. I'm sorry, it's not a refinement. Scratch that. We are asking you to vote this afternoon um, that the regulations as presented in the staff report and the attachment and the presentation, um, that you all vote for us to publish that in the Maryland Register. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to <laughs> Our missing chairman. Do you want to see if there are questions? Before we take a vote, are there any questions? No question. <laughs> so, once it gets published, what's the process after publication of a regulation? So what happens after this step is that we send the regulations to the Administrative, Executive, and Legislative Review Committee. And they review our regulations, and if they have any questions, they will contact me. They review them from a legal standpoint and from a fiscal standpoint. So um, that information is transmitted from me to them, but if they have any questions. Um, and then, if everything's okay with them, it will be put in the Maryland Register, and there is a 30-day uh, public comment period, formal public comment period. So I mentioned to you all, we do reach out to stakeholders prior to this time before we bring it to the commission, because if anybody's out there who has some issues that we can fix now, we prefer to do them now before we publish them formally. We did not receive any um, substantive comments, so we don't have any changes today. After the 30-day comment period, um, the the regulations will come back to this body, and I will ask you all to consider uh, a vote one more time so that I can republish them in the register as what's called final regulations. And when that happens, 10 days after the regulations are published in the Maryland register, they become effective. So they reprint in Comar, and they are actually, you know, in effect. So, so, so there's additional there's an additional opportunity to comment yes. and if changes need to be made, there's additional opportunities for those changes to be made before it's public. Okay. That is correct. And if um, if somebody contacts us and they want to make a change, we have to determine whether it's what we consider a substantive change versus a non substantive change. So if it's non substantive, so it's a change but it's not gonna 
directly affect those that are being regulated, it's just like a tweak, then that is something we can move forward with. However, if the change is determined non-substantive, and these determinations are made by our Assistant Attorney General, in other words, the change would be something that would have an effect on, you know, a direct effect on the regulated community, then we have to start back at the very beginning of the process. So we would rewrite the regulation, propose it to this body, you all would consider it, then we go through the whole process again. The regulatory process typically takes about 90 days in Maryland. However, with our body, because we have the commission vote on it when they're proposed, and then we wait, and then we have you all vote on it a second time for me to publish it as final, it, it takes several months more um, because we wait for the commission to meet and, and have a you know consideration of it before we move forward. Can I really quickly, Commissioner Eames, if you need to go, that's okay. At 16, we still have a quorum. Mm -hmm. Thank I you. Sure, it. thank you. Sorry, go ahead, Commissioner Taylor. Uh, in the previous slide, uh, you showed that there were, uh, before that, there were several counties, I think, listed. Uh, it's not on this page, but there were several counties listed, uh, eight, eight counties listed, that were limited to half of their growth allocations. Why were those names specifically, and why were they limited? Yeah, this goes back to the history of when they wrote that particular part in our statute. So in the Natural Resources article, there is a section, and actually the regulations in 2701 to 06 limit the statute. And there's a pair, it's a long paragraph, and it, as um, Commissioner Taylor notes, it specifically lists out um, basically the rural counties in Maryland. So therefore, it excludes Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Prince George's County, Hartford. I think all the other counties are included. So back in the late 80s, um, there was a compromise drawn in the legislature to allow certain counties to have um, some... I guess, leeway when they were applying their growth allocation that was allocated to them from the beginning. Um, that was not allowed in the more urban counties that are specifically not listed. But what happens is when you read that section of the law, it's not clear what happens with the towns. So we believe the intent of the law was that because we want to see the growth happen around the smaller municipalities or larger municipalities, that's where we want it to occur rather than that they have the benefit of using more than their half of their alloc allocated growth allocation. So we're making that clear in the regulation. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So I'm going to turn this over to Chairman Deegan. Thank you, Lisa. Did you uh, thank the appropriate people in helping you with this? Yes. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Commissioner Taylor. Thank you, Commissioner Greer. <laughs> and some of your staff that's not here today, former employees. Oh, you mean the folks that helped draft these? Yes. Yes. I, I think you. we should mention that. To let yeah, so I've mentioned before that when we're doing some of these, um, the updates to the, the Title 27, in fact, this is almost the last one. We have one more coming probably in the next several months. Um, we have had former staff come back. Um, Charlie has been gracious enough to allow them to come and assist me with that. And one of them is um, Margaret McHale, who is former chair mm. of the commission. Um, we've also had former executive director Renzieri um, come back. And we have also had the privilege, particularly since he's retired, uh, Gary Setzer, who used to work with MDE, say, hey, I'll, I'll come help you, which was great because we've been working on the water dependent facilities chapter, we've been working on the Shore Ridge Control chapter. So we have all that institutional knowledge um, that helps us. You know, it, it makes my job so much easier. Um, but soon I won't have them, so I'll be left <laughs> to my own devices. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, we have the assistance of our attorney general, who keeps keeps it all legal. So we thank Emily as well. Thanks, Lisa. And I just thought it was a, I for one know how much effort goes into this. Watching you and that group, you know, I never know when they're coming. So, uh, <laughs> but it's not it's not unusual to see them in the conference room all day long. And it, most it ever cost me or Kate is, is pizza, I think. So uh, I re really appreciate the effort they did, and I think they, you know, I ought to be recognized for it. Okay, um, with that, um, 
We'll have a motion from Sue Greer. Mr. Chairman, on behalf of the program subcommittee, I make a motion one to approve the regulations affecting the following code of Maryland regulations. Comar 27.01.01 General Provisions, Comar 27.01.02 Development in a Critical Area, Comar 27.01.04 Shore Erosion Protection Works, Comar 27.01.09 Habitat Protection Areas in the Critical Area, Comar 27.01.14 Renewable Energy Generating Systems, Comar 27.02.01 General Provisions, Comar 27.02.05 State Agency Actions Resulting in Development on State Owned Lands. Two, to approve regulations that amend regulation .01 under Comar 27.01.01 general provisions, amend regulation .06-1 and .06-3 under Comar 27.01.02 development in the critical area, adopt regulation .01-1 and amend regulations .02 and .03 under Comar 27.01.04 shore erosion protection works, amend regulations .01 0.01-2 and 0.01-3 under Comar 27.01.09 Habitat Protection Areas in the Critical Area, amend regulation 0.06 under Comar 27.01.14 Renewable Energy Generating Systems, amend regulation 0.01 under Comar 27.02.01 General Provisions, and amend regulations 0.05 and 0.15-3 under Comar 27.02.05 State Agency Actions on State-Owned Lands. And, number three, to authorize commission staff to forward this draft to the Administrative, Executive, and Legislative Review Committee and subsequently to publish these regulations as proposed regulations in the Maryland Register. Who would like to second that? Second. Oh, I don't know who to take now. Did you get a second? That's right. I was going to let Nicole halfway do it. Second. Okay. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, thank you very much. I assume you're ready to vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any extension? Uh, uh, abstentions. abstentions, I know. <laughs> seeing none, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on now to programs. Any, and we're right on time, pretty much. That's good. Lisa, thank you very much for that. Uh, not just today, but for. I just want to let you know that I, I appreciate the work that you and that whole group did, and, and keeping me out of it. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta be a special person to deal with these regulations day in and day out. Alrighty, I will get started now. Hi everybody, I am Annie Sikarik and I will be presenting the St. Mary's County Supplemental Use Standard Text Amendment. So just for really quick reference, St. Mary's County is located on this map in red. The proposed text amendment will remove an existing provision from a specific supplemental use standard of the county code. Supplemental use standard number 122 affects residential swimming pools across the county. Among other items, the existing standards prohibit a residential property owner in the critical area from applying for a variance to disturb the buffer for the purpose of installing a swimming pool and associated decks. Removal of this provision will provide the property owner in the a property owner in the critical area the opportunity to apply to the County Board of Appeals for a buffer variance. The proposed text change does not affect the requirement for a variance to meet all seven critical area variance standards. Any variance request presented to the St. Mary's County Board of Appeals must be evaluated based on the standards in the state law and regulations. Typically, a residential pool fails to meet the standard of unwarranted hardship because it is considered an amenity as opposed to being integral to the reasonable use of the residential property. However, state law and regulations do not prohibit an application for any specific type of a variance to a critical area program. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Chairman Deegan. Okay, do we have any questions for Annie? Seeing none, I recognize Sue Brett. Mr. Chairman, the program subcommittee, after very robust, good discussion, concurs with the chairman's determination 
the St. Mary's County Ordinance 2022-24 may be processed as a refinement to St. Mary's County's critical area program. Further, the subcommittee finds that the proposed changes are consistent with the purposes, policies, and goals of the critical area law and regulations, and as such, recommends the chairman approve St. Mary's County Ordinance 2022-24 as proposed. Okay, I'll, I'll accept that, and that'll be my final decision. Thank you. And that was a nice discussion you had this morning. Okay, uh, Alex Deweese. Staff had a nice baby shower for Alex that I wasn't able to attend. I thought we'd have pictures of that instead of Bob's rocking. <laughs> Charlotte, let me down. <laughs> I think that's the only baby shower I remember seeing pictures of a pony. <laughs> Yes, there was a guest appearance by a miniature pony. It was amazing. <laughs> um, All right, so good afternoon. Again, my name is Alex DeWeese. First, I'll be presenting the Town of Chesapeake City's critical area map update. Um, the city is located within um, Cecil County, which is highlighted in red on this map of Maryland. Um, and then, more specifically, it's located in kind of central Cecil County, I guess, along the um, Chesapeake and Delaware Canal or the C&D Canal. So as per 2008 updates to the critical area law, um, as you all know, we're required to remap the thousand foot boundary for each of our jurisdictions based on recent technologies. Um, more specifically, as per Comar 270111, we remap that boundary every 12 years. Um, and this is, again, because our original maps were hand-drawn based off of very old photos, and there were some inaccuracies. Um, and additionally, our map updates acknowledge that our coasts naturally change over time. Um, so staff from the county, the commission, DNR, MDE, and the Eastern Shore Regional GIS Cooperative collaborated on this update. And the maps were presented at a public meeting in the town, um, and there were opportunities for public comment as well. So, ordinance number 2022-002 was adopted by mayor and town council on July 11th to approve the maps. Um, so I know you all are familiar with these maps, but just to orient you a little bit, the town boundary is outlined in um, this white dashed line, so it's kind of irregularly shaped. Um, again, the CND canal runs through the middle of it. The current critical area boundary is represented by this red line here. Um, the proposed critical area boundary is in green. And then you'll notice that there's only IDA in red and LDA in yellow. And that's because the town doesn't have any RCA. Um, the surrounding critical area in the county does, though, um, but that's just not shown on this particular map. So this map update leads to a 6.0 acre gain in critical area, 0.7 acres loss for a net gain of 6.1. Um, and then 246 and a half acres remain the same. Um, this is just a quick map that I wanted to um, mention that's always available for anyone who's curious about the uh, current status of the map update for a particular jurisdiction. This is available on our, our website. So I will turn it back over to Chairman Deegan. What's the dog's name? Theo. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? I can see none. The chair recognizes the program subcommittee chairman, Super. Mr. Chairman, the program subcommittee concurs with the chairman's determination that the Town of Chesapeake City's map update may be reviewed as a refinement to the Town of Chesapeake City's critical area program. Further, the subcommittee finds the proposed changes are consistent with the purposes, policy, and goals of the critical area, law, and regulations, and as such, recommend that the chairman approve the map update as proposed. Okay, I appreciate your concurrence, and that will stand as my final decision. Thank you very much. Okay, Alex, you got one more, and then we can get rolling out of here before the rain. Yes, thank you. 
Um, again, Alex Deweese, um, we're going to stay in Chesapeake City, and next we're reviewing their comprehensive review. Um, and again, Chesapeake City is located in Cecil County along the CND Canal. And uh, before I move on, I wanted to mention the two attachments to your staff report. There's one, the first one, um, that includes changes recommended by commission staff, um, which will go over briefly, shortly. Um, and the second is the adopted ordinance without our revisions. So as you know, as per Natural Resources Article 8-1809G, um, critical area programs are required to be reviewed and updated every six years. Chesapeake City's program was adopted in August of 1988, but their last comprehensive review was in October of 2012, so it was time for them to go through this process. And as you just heard, the map update is happening simultaneously. On July 11, 2002, the Town Council voted to adopt and the Mayor signed Ordinance 2022-001, amending Article 8 of their Critical Area Section of the Town Comprehensive Development Ordinance. All of the updates were based on municipal model ordinance provided by our staff and updates to state law. And this included updates to the project notification section, water dependent facility standards, RCA density and use standards, growth allocation, an alternative adjacency standard, after the fact variance procedures, and buffer establishment. None of these are outside of the box um, changes, they're all standard. Um, so again, I just wanted to throw this map up here and point out that the town is entirely IDA and LDA, no RCA, and most of the waterfront is designated as a modified buffer area. So the changes that our staff proposed without going into a lot of detail, um, this is kind of a summary of it. They're all non-substantive and minor edits that are just necessary for clarification purposes and to bring all the language into conformance. Um, so some examples include replacement of municipality in brackets with the town of Chesapeake City. This is just left left over from our model ordinance where the town was meant to replace municipality with their own name. Um, deletion of instructive footnotes that are part of the model, as well as some minor text changes for consistency with the law and regulations. Um, we did discuss these in more detail and review them in more detail this morning, and there were no um, questions or concerns with those changes, and of course the town is aware of um, what we're requesting from them. In our conversations with the town, they indicated that the revisions we've sent to them can be included when the ordinance is formally incorporated into the zoning code. So, back over to Chairman Deegan. Same dog? That's a different one. So the little so. one is Theo, the big one's Grace. Okay. <laughs> Same questions. <laughs> the chair recognized Sue Greer, chairman of the program mm -hmm. subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The program subcommittee concurs with the chairman's determination that the comprehensive review of the town of Chesapeake City's critical area program may be processed as a refinement to the town of Chesapeake City's critical area program. Further, the subcommittee finds the proposed changes are consistent with the purposes, policies, and goals of the critical area law and regulations and as such, recommend the chairman approve the town of Chesapeake City's comprehensive review with the conditions and edits set forth in the revised attachment one to the staff report dated September 7th, 2022, so long as such conditions and changes are incorporated into the town of Chesapeake City's critical area program within 120 days of the chairman's approval. Thank you, I appreciate the committee's concurrence and I'll set, this will stand as my final decision. And you know we're going to get out of here before two o'clock, depending on Kate. I, I noticed you have your, you have. Uh, I don't have any real old business except to remind people that they got the red shirts this time. You might want to wear them next time. Uh, we'll let, we'll let you know we got some thing, things planned for our next meeting. <laughs> and uh, are you going to talk about Poplar Island? Yes. Okay, um, then we'll go right to Kate, and we'll get out of here by two. Yes, yeah, some of you are probably waiting to hear the details on Poplar Island, so that is still on for next Wednesday, the 14th. Um, I hope to get the final pickup details um, 
for Sandy Point State Park for many of you, and then a Tillman Island for a few of you on the lower shore. And um, you'll get that email hopefully by tomorrow morning. And if there's anyone else who would like to go, please reach out. I might there might be spots for one or two left. I can check in with them. Yes. That it. That's it. Our illustrious attorney told me that she didn't have anything legal. So. <laughs> I don't have Did anything any change since yesterday? No, nothing okay. changed since yesterday afternoon. <laughs> All right, then we'll stand adjourned unless anybody else has something to say. I thank, uh, thank you again for your attendance today. I appreciate it and your service.